on this feast of the angels to uh, open with the uh, St. Michael prayer. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the end. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the heavenly hosts, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the other evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruination of souls. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're going to delve into the medieval church, uh, which is a rather extensive topic, but I'd like to center on two things, how you see the church go sort of from rags to riches, if you will. Uh, and, but what's even more interesting, I find, is uh, especially in the technological world that we live in, in this time of the church, the, um, the church had a great building up and a great growth through poverty, which is interesting. And so um, if you're worried about your stock portfolio, not a problem. Your account in heaven is quite substantial, and that's what we worry about. Okay, and so um, we start with the, the, a revival through poverty. Christianity in the Middle Ages was profoundly influenced by monastic life, especially the mendicant orders. One could be so bold as to say that through the grace of um, God and these monks of ministry, the poor made uh, the church very rich in faith. Monks for the poor, mendicant orders, or beggars, beggar friars. They lived a strict life of poverty. Uh, one. One throwback to that you can see today is, has anybody heard of the FPOs? Okay, the Franciscans of the Primitive Order. The only possession they have and hold is an ID card so they won't be arrested as vagrants. They beg daily for what they need. And um, I don't know where their local house is right now, but for quite a while they had a house at... They're in Roxbury. Okay, thank you. Uh, they, they have a house at the pleasure of the bishop. The bishop gives them a place to stay, but they had to ask for it. So they beg. And they beg for the food that they get daily. Uh, they don't have cars. Uh, I'm not sure if they have a phone now. No, no phone. Okay, so you have to communicate it to, to them with writing. Um, or if uh, they need a ride, um, they'll ask for one uh, when it's offered, or they'll walk. Imagine walking from Roxbury to Manchester to preach a mission. They d so they did not live in a cloister or a monastery. And they did not own property. They took vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. They lived off alms. In other words, every day they begged for what they needed, much like the FPOs today. Mostly itinerant preachers of the gospel moving from town to town and village to village. Literally like Jesus would say, foxes have uh, uh, dens and snakes have lairs, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Two of the most celebrated mendicant orders are the Franciscans and the Dominicans. We're going to key on them, but they're not 
the exclusive mendicant orders. However, uh, they are considered the original two from which others developed. So the Franciscans, that's a, a picture of um, the monastery, the Franciscan monastery of in Assisi. And there's our beloved St. Francis, the founder of the Franciscans, from the Italian region of Umbria, a son of a wealthy merchant. Interesting, huh? He dreamed of fighting in the Crusades. And at the age of 16, he got to fight against the Perguins who held the castle of his hometown, Assisi. So Francis began as a warrior, you could say. He was wounded in battle and captured. And during his captivity, he fell ill. So from the ashes of trauma comes his conversion. After his illness, Francis became more spiritual. Prayer and meditation on the life of Christ became his major preoccupation. This is very similar to St. Ignatius, by the way, if you, if you want to connect the dots. He began to lose his interest in the things of the world. It's amazing what an illness can do. It's amazing the perspective that cancer survivors have after they've come through that. Francis, rebuild my house, is the word he heard from the Lord. Around age 22, during his time of prayer, he heard a voice. Francis, rebuild my house, the voice commanded. So Francis obeyed the voice. He immediately made plans to renovate the church of his town. He took linens and cloth from his father's business, sold them, and gave the money to the local priest who refused the gift. Francis's father beat him for wasting his money. So Francis ran away and hid in a cave for around a month. When he finally returned to the village, he found contempt and torment from the townspeople, and he was also ill from the time in the cave. Francis's father disowned him and even brought him before the bishop for discipline because his father couldn't understand why being disowned didn't disturb him, but he was already moving toward renouncing everything, so Francis was already in a different direction. didn't matter. Before the bishop and the villagers, Francis threw off all his clothes and said that from that day, he would only call one father, our Father in heaven. The bishop was so moved by Francis's convictions to serve God that he covered him with his own robe and accepted him as a servant of God and took him under his care. Francis then found solitude in the hills outside of Assisi where he spent his days fasting and in prayer. It was around this time that Francis became enlightened about his vocation, his strict speak, strictly speaking, his call from God, what he was to do really with his life. One day at Mass, he was struck by the words of the Gospel, instructing the apostles to take no shoes and no cloak or staff or money and preach the Gospel. Francis then began his life of begging, living with the poor, and preaching the gospel. Notice who he was concerned about living with the poor. So the order is on its way. In 1209, Francis gained his first two brothers. Soon he had 11 followers. He composed a rule based on the gospel and its mandate to embrace a life of poverty. In 1210, Francis took a journey to Rome 
so that he could gain the approval of his order from Pope Innocent III. The day before his meeting with the Pope, Innocent III had a dream of meeting Francis, although he didn't know who he was. He had this dream of a person and a recognizable face. The Pope, um, the next day, of course, has this encounter with Francis, and he's completely overwhelmed and really sees the hand of God here. And so the Pope immediately approves Francis's order. Can you imagine going from being um, disowned by your father, but yet hanging on to your convictions, and the father of all Christianity now embraces you? Isn't it fantastic? In 1223, Pope the III would formally accept the rule and order of St. Francis. So Francis calls out for reform. He doesn't just preach to the poor, but his own spiritual life was fortified by the Eucharist where he found vitality and strength, so his life became a proclamation. He begged the clergy to show more reverence and respect to, to the Holy Mass. He called upon bishops to provide more rural chapels for access to the Blessed Sacrament. And he finally got to go on the crusade that he dreamed of. When the Fifth Crusade sent out, uh, Francis tagged along. In 1219, he traveled to Syria. After capture and beatings, he somehow was brought to the Sultan. The Sultan was intrigued and impressed by Francis, especially because of his poverty and his humility, and he befriended him. Imagine that. Francis taught the faith to the Sultan because he was very interested in it, curious, and, but the Sultan was never converted. However, he became um, very benevolent toward Francis and the Christian faith. So the Sultan granted Francis safe passage in the Holy Land and entrusted Francis's order with the care of the shrines, which still stands to this day, which explains why Franciscans are in charge of most of the shrines there in the Middle East. In the later years of Francis, he was never ordained a priest. Okay. He was a deacon. By the end of his life, his order had grown to 5,000 friars. Imagine that. His last years, Francis prayed to be in greater union with the passion of Christ. Be careful what you pray for, gentlemen. On September 14th, on the Feast of the Exaltation of the Cross, he received the stigmata, that is, the marks of Christ. And trust me, he got all the pain and the agony that goes with those wounds. That was part of his participation in the Passion of Christ. On October 4th, Francis died at Assisi, his hometown. Francis was canonized in 1228 by Pope Gregory IX. Notice the timeline after his death. It didn't take him very long, did it? Okay. And of course we know why today. By the way, just before we get into uh, the next slides here, um, one of the reasons why Francis is known as the patron of animals, of course, is some of you may know the story. Uh, there was a wolf menacing his town. And so he went out to see the wolf and explained to him that the people of the town were made in God's image and they need to be respected that way. 
and um, he was counseled about the vir the wolf was counseled about the virtues of the Eucharist, and the wolf never bothered the townspeople or their animals after that, and they even endeared themselves to the wolf as a pet and began to feed him and take care of him. Okay, so Francis, uh, uh, a hard act to follow. Um, behind him comes Saint Bonaventure. He was a Franciscan friar, a great theologian, spiritual writer, and philosopher. He became the intellect, if you will, of the order. He was the definitive biographer of St. Francis. He was inter instrumental in helping to see the election of Pope Gregory X. And he ushered in a new era for the Franciscans. You can see with 5,000 friars under Francis that they had to sort of adjust for the times and for the growth in their order. One of the problems that they had was they had so many friars they required housing. So he revised the rule to allow for receiving donations, but these donations were sent to the Holy See for the preservation of the order. The Holy See could own houses and therefore could allow the Franciscans to live in them at the goodwill of the Pope. Just like in, this, in a way the, the, the Franciscans of the primitive order today rely on the charity of the Cardinal to sustain their order. They don't own anything and yet they do have a place to stay from which they can go out and do their missionary work. The friars were able to keep their vow of poverty while at the generosity of the Pope prosper in numbers of friars. Next we have the Dominicans. Again, I'm, I'm just giving you snippets because there's a vast there's a, a vast amount of stuff to discuss here, but these, these are like, you could say, little cameos of um, these orders. So next we would have the Dominicans. They're Catholic preachers, uh, known as OP, Orders of Preachers. Catholic preachers uh, at the time were having difficulties winning souls from the Albigensian heresy. Inspired by the need to contend with the Albigensians um, on an intellectual term, St. Dominic opened a monastery under the rule of St. Augustine. Now this is very, very briefly stated. I gave you uh, the, um, the Albigensian heresy is kind of a complex thing. I'm just giving you a, um, enough so you get the idea. 12th century in southern France it was most popular. Um, a duality between good and evil was seen in their theological understanding. God is good and created the spirit. So God has to do with the spiritual world, not necessarily the material world. Evil is created, created the material world. And so what does that mean? That means the body is evil. The human body is therefore evil, holding the soul prisoner. Jesus is the Redeemer, but a mere creature who is not truly human, otherwise he would have to be under the control of evil. So his humanity is not really there according to this heresy. <coughs> St. <Saint> Dominic, <coughs> also known as uh, Dominic of Os Osma and Dominic of, well I can't pronounce that, and Dominic de Guzman. Okay. A Spanish priest who founded the order who would settle in France. He lived a life of poverty and sent his followers to the University of Paris. Remember, he, he thought that, that there needed to be more of an intellectual incursion on the need to evangelize. After training, they were sent out in pairs to live and preach the gospel. And 
they became known as the Order of Preachers, who are still around today. We have Dominicans in, um, in uh, Dartmouth. Uh, at, uh, they're running the campus ministry at Dartmouth College, and they're stationed in Hanover, and uh, they're at the hospital there also. St. Dominic and the Rosary, okay? It's commonly credited to St. Dominic, the Rosary. He was said to have had a vision of the Blessed Mother handing it to him. Now you see that uh, the scriptures were not necessarily readily available um, in, in this time. Um, and the Dominic needed a way to promote good biblical spirituality. And so the Rosary became the handmaid of that for him. Isn't that interesting? Okay. Some historians, however, believe um, that another Dominican, his name was Alain de Roup, was the original recipient of the vision who shared it with St. Dominic, and it's in Dominic's preaching that it became popular. I just wanted to show you how impressive this uh, by the 13 uh, by the 1300s, this is um, the expansion of the Franciscans, where they had communities. Look at that! Isn't that amazing? That's about 200 years, and to do that, they're everywhere in Europe, all on the vehicle of ministry to the poor. This is the uh, expansion of the Dominican monasteries. Same thing, isn't it? Amazing. We need another, another revival for the poor in Europe, and probably in the United States too. Well, not probably, absolutely. I want to go into the next thing, the, the medieval architecture, because when you look at medieval architecture, it is um, it takes the, it takes the church buildings into a new place, and it's literally what I talked, what I said in the opening slide. It's a kind of a rags to riches story, um, but the building of these basilicas and cathedrals and great works of art really employed the poor, and yet, and from this you get a, an, an abundance of wealth for the church. So this is one of the things that comes out of the, the medieval times, this, um, this renaissance of architecture and art. So I want to I look at two key Gothic cathedrals, just to give you an idea. They have higher vaulted ceilings to reflect the transcendence and power of God. By the way, St. Marie's Church is uh, considered a classic Gothic cathedral, and you'll see some of these traits in it as we, we talk about it. The, the cruciform nave was also characteristic. If you look at it, an aerial shot of a, a classic Gothic cathedral, it'll look like a cross. And if you go into the church, you have some kind of cru crucifix structure. Uh, that is, you walk in, and that's the long length of the cross, and the sacristy at the sanctuary becomes the top end of the cross. And uh, the side entrances, or sometimes even seating on the sides, becomes the two arms of the cross, intentionally formed that way. You usually had vast stained glass windows that gave light and the image of, the, of, of, of Bible stories and the saints. And so for the poor who may have been illiterate, these cathedrals and basilicas, you could say they, they became the media of the times to show them the stories of scripture and the stories of the lives of the saints just in the appearance of the windows. Also, in hand, um, sort of announcing the light of Christ, it became uh, uh, more um, popular to open the churches uh, with these vast windows so that they could pour in more light. Here's Notre Dame in Paris. Uh, this is quite impressive. You notice uh, the uh, 
that looks like it has ribs on the long wall on the long side of the church. Those are what they call flying buttresses that, to support it from the outside to support the walls and the structure as it was standing. That's the front facade. That's another view closer. And that's an interior of the um, main aisle in the nave. Next you have the Cathedral of Chartres. That's also in France, of course. Notice how long it took to build that. And you see the similarities. Um, if you know, you notice the uh, one of the one of the towers, the tower closest to you. After that, you see the ribs on the side again, the flying buttresses. That would be one of the side altars. Look at the beautiful windows. That's the that's the main floor and aisle. Now, what you see um, what you see there at the at the base that's a labyrinth that is um, uh, it's one of the characteristics of this church. It's uh, a lot of people talk about that, so you'll you see that right in the church. And there's your questions for the day. I have copies of your questions, and we'll end with a glory be for this part of the presentation segueing into your discussion. All glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Oh,